Hello, my name is Kimberly Cameris. I've recently graduated with a PhD in regenerative futures and I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Marcus Bussey as, as my supervisor throughout that journey. I've been wanting to ask Marcus for some time a little bit more about neo-humanism and the philosophy around, around the neo-humanist thought. Uh, Dr. Marcus Bussey is a senior lecturer at the University of the Sunshine Coast, but also um, a neo-humanist himself and someone who um, is deeply involved in exploring cultural futures and also a very spiritual person who himself meditates regularly. So I'm keen to talk to you today, Marcus, to understand how neo-humanism and the philosophy around neo-humanism um, in parts on all those aspects of your life and of your work. And I'm particularly keen to discuss your article, your most recent article, The Neo-Humanist Moment and Our Planetary Futures. Yep. So I might kick off with a, a question from that article, Marcus, and then we can see where it goes from there. Sure, perfect. So in the article, this most recent article, you speak about... Um, humanism's message of being one human family and neo-humanism's message of being one cosmic family and there's a difference there in scale and I really loved the um, description of neo-humanism as a love and respect for all beings animate and inanimate in the universe. Yeah. Could you explain the concept of a cosmic family a little bit more and do you see this understanding manifesting around you in any way? Thank you. That's a great question. And thank you for the nice introduction, Kim. Um, yeah, for me, the struggle that we've faced as a species has been to learn to survive and thrive, which we've done differentially around the planet, some places better than others. Uh, and that's been pretty much based on affinities or kinship groups whether it's the family the tribe the state or the empire depending on what period of history we're in um and it's taken us out of that sort of the loving embrace you could say of the uh, the pre-modern uh pre-neolithic world where you know uh, the original human beings were very much embedded in the natural ecosystem yeah. and they felt that they felt connected they didn't feel above or outside of they they were internal to that and we had to sacrifice that sense of connection because of you know as we evolved we uh, were constantly struggling with the natural environment the mm. natural environment was dangerous it could kill us uh, and we were a pretty useless species, you know, we don't have claws and teeth and everything. So what, what did we have? Well, we had a kind of um, collective intelligence. Mm. We were, we we survived because we belonged to groups, kinship groups, networks of some kind or other. And I, that reminds me that, you know, Margaret Mead was asked, well, how do we know when civilization started and she said it's when we get the first archaeological evidence of really bad injuries that have healed really bad broken bones and so yeah. that have healed which means of course that for maybe many months that individual hominid you know even before human uh, homo sapiens was cared for yeah. by the group and so that care is, indicates something very special happening in the evolution of the human species um, but, you know, at the same time, we had to, to basically dominate the world around us. Ultimately, we had to break free from that. But, you know, what's happening now, we've reached a point in our civilization, industrial civilization, where we are so disconnected from the, from the planetary ecological systems that everything becomes um, a utility, something that we can resource, that we can draw on. Yeah. And it's also something we have to manage. We have to manage everything. Large groups of people we have to manage. So we have states, laws, infrastructure, you know, the whole story. And it, everything else gets lost. So to so the scale of humanism, which was, you know, a, a wonderful intellectual movement from, you know, the last 500 years, um, still continue that trajectory of human e exceptionalism we're facing something very different 
with you know the planetary conditions uh there's a, a, a massive awareness amongst you know a, a lots of people not just in the west but everywhere mm. that something is fundamentally wrong and that we've lost something we're now starting to wake up to the fact we've lost relational connection uh, even in cities where there's so many people we 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 often are alienated and that leads to mental illness and and so on it also leads to you know increased levels of violence um and the violence is not just against one another it's also against the planet so for me the neo-humanist takes that the concept of humanism of we are one family which you articulated beautifully just before we are now having to say okay humanism has raised our awareness of the commitment to every human being on the planet being within the group it's still a project that's not realized we've still got massive you know in, uh, imbalances there but there's another level of consciousness awareness coming now that is saying and it's not just coming from my corner of the world the near humans corner of the world it's coming all over the place that we belong to this entire creation and that we have responsibilities as you know technologically advanced species we have responsibilities to that greater than usness and that takes us out of our small little pocket but it also means we can become more aware of how do i live in my small unique context each of us has a responsibility to to live well in terms of equity and justice inclusivity uh, self-love we have to be able to care for ourselves in order that we can care for others and th that leads to you know how do we teach how do we run our societies what are our laws how do i relate to the person next door but not just that how do i relate to the trees and to the air and to the earth and so on it's it's, it's it, there is a kind of logic to neo-humanism that extends the logic of humanism that we are relationally enmeshed and that relationships well what are they that that if we don't have them we are isolated lonely we grieve as a, as an individual relationships are actually and this is where the spirituality stuff comes in you know it's it's about love it's about mm. being authentically able to love not in that grasping manipulative sense of romantic you know european love it's about being able to love as a as a form of care but also as a spiritual practice so for me it goes into everything there's nothing that you can't it doesn't get touched should i say there's nothing that doesn't get touched by that um deep awareness of family it's family it's familial but you know i'm i have family with the sun and the stars and the moon just as much as microbes micro uh what, what do we call them quarks and you know yeah. going right down to the smallest as well we, we're just sort of enmeshed in this it's interesting because it um obviously aligns quite beautifully with these ideas of regenerative futures and regenerative thinking that solving the planetary crisis that we're in won't be possible with the same worldviews and stories that we tell ourselves that have created the issues that we're experiencing yeah. and fundamentally involving a complete shift to understand that um, we're not separate from nature but you know neo-humanism taking that one step further to not just include nature but also all of the cosmic entities that potentially surround us so um, I think that's a nice segue into a question around as a futurist or as uh, people who are um, you know integrating futures thinking and futures methods into our work into our thinking how can we integrate this um, concept of a cosmic family and why is it even important to do so and I think you've touched on some of the reasons why um, yeah. but I think that 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 mindset or that I that, those ideas put a different onus on what our actions in the present are and and what our um you know sort of images of the future could be as well so I'd love you to expand on that a little bit too Marcus if you can sure um I think one of the key things about 
being more aware, just more aware, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, more aware of the systems that we're part of in terms of socio-ecological systems or, you know, medical systems, in educational. I mean, we're, we're in parts of systems. Systems are everywhere. To be more aware is the first step. That doesn't mean to become paranoid. It doesn't mean to be, you know, like conspiracy theory paranoia. It doesn't mean to become cynical. <clears throat> I know that those rich people are, you know, doing that or the government's going to let us down or, you know, the industrialists or the system and everybody's self. Not that kind of negative stuff. It's to see that, that the awareness is also the awareness that we are part of bigger stories which we can never really see because we're swimming in them. We're, we're in, you know, we're, it's kind of like, does the fish, you know, know it's wet or in water? Um, but, but this awareness is the awareness of, it's a heart awareness. It's not just an intellectual awareness. There are plenty of clever, clever people around who can do all the, you know, the analyses we need. But they're still often caught in small circles it's it's kind of like i'm a discipline my discipline is marine biology and that's what i do and i know that and i know that you know these social systems are affecting those ecosystems but it's it's like this and i think for me whatever we want to call it i'm calling it near humanism and in that article i say why it's because you know it's it's been the vehicle for me over nearly 40 years now of thinking within a certain cultural, intellectual, civilizational, intellectual, whatever we want to call it, context. But your question is, what can we do? And I think, you know, that's, it's just to start off appreciating. It's, this, it's to catch ourselves when we, when our hope is leaking out because we're feeling powerless because what am I? I'm just one small human being on a planet. Which is easy to do when you think about the scale of all of the um, crises that the planet's facing. Absolutely. So to me, part of this then is, you know, academically you would say it's ontological. It's the kind of stories that we tell ourselves. What does it mean to, to be at this point in our planetary evolution? It's not just human evolution where everything is going to <laughs> Here, which is what evolution does and you know i'm a i i really think that there are points where we have steady state and then there are those uh, galloping points which um what's his name stephen jay gould used to talk about you know um that so and we're at one of those points we're at a threshold and you know we've seen i'm a historian as well so i've seen that the past can you know societies hit a threshold everything goes wrong it either and they either transcend it in some way or they fall back we don't know which way what's going to happen for us yet absolutely i think it was interesting mm -hmm. um in your article marcus too um you know there's this discussion about global citizenship or being a global citizen and i was wondering as you were talking then what do you think about the concept of being a universal citizen or um, expanding that idea of global citizenship to incorporate some of those neurohumanist ideas? Thanks for that. Uh, uh, to me, that's the, um, um, you know, we talk about the hidden curriculum. If you did education, so you'd remember that. That's, that's my hidden curriculum, <laughs> is that, you know, the global, you know, th getting most people to think at the global level is hard enough to think at the cosmic level, um, it's not even a conceptual task for me. It's a, a, again, it's a relational task. It's emotional. It's to provide the impetus, the skill, and also feed the curiosity behind this whole thing. What does it mean to be me right now? What does it mean to be us, a family or a community? What So these questions should invite curiosity because I don't think well, look, answers don't work. A response can be heading more positively. And if a response creates positive energy that is not sucking the energy out of some other system, 
then that's the kind of response that I'm personally aiming for. And I try to educate for that. I try to facilitate that. Um, but it's often about really coming back to the very basics of me in my body, relating to you in your body, in a way that's respectful, generous, exciting, all those things. Um, so when I do workshoppy type stuff, I actually do a lot of embodied work, movement, dance, improvisation, um, playing where the body enacts its own stories and it, and it and it activates its own wisdom. That wisdom is not something that, you know, Socrates sitting around going like that. It's, you know, that that's a kind of wisdom. But it's if it's the head up, it's very shallow and it's more likely to see us caught in the in the systems already. Like you said, the system, we try trying to solve the problem with the logic of the system that we're within is, is never going to work. You know, we need somehow to discover keys to alternative futures and also to read alternative presence into our present. That's It's interesting too because um, it reminds me a little bit of this discussion between sustainability and regeneration. It's not a zero-sum mm. game. It's not saying sustainability is bad, regeneration is good. It's not saying humanism is bad, neo-humanism is good, or global citizenship is bad and universal ci citizenship is good. It's about saying that can we stretch the idea of what's aspirational, what's possible, or um, beyond some of the concepts that we may have previously utilised. So yeah. um, I think that's a really beautiful way of putting it. So it's interesting when you uh, talk about those different ideas, Marcus, it uh, reminds me of some of the thinking I've been doing about regeneration and that many people have been doing about regeneration, that it's not saying that what's been done to date is bad or, um, you know, that sustainability and creating no further harm is bad. Of course it's not, but it's about stretching, I think, our thinking into what's possible um, for, for our futures. And I think that's the same when you talk about this idea of a hidden curriculum or, um you know, the expansion of our, our minds and our thinking about what type of family we're part of. Um, it's, it's um, you know, we're all at our own points along that journey perhaps, but if we can provide opportunities for, yeah. for thinking in that way, I think that's um, that's where the, where the joy can come. So um, I also just, I have a couple of more questions for you. Um, one going a little bit into the past, although <laughs> time is obviously not linear as we know, but, um, and one about, our own practices, um, which you did touch on before when you talked about embodied uh, practices. But before we get to that, um, you talk about and write about the work of Sarkar and others, and there's this understanding of weaving Indigenous and ancient philosophies and, and wisdoms with the European tradition of humanism. Yep. Yep. And I think in the article you called it um, creative traditionalism. Oh, yes. But you also speak about the need for a compass to help us to work from the past to the future. And I think the example you used was, you know, we can't wholesale and, you know, there's, there are there are um, challenges and, and issues in wholesale kind of taking of traditions from the past and putting them into a, a present or a future context without yeah. thought and reflection or without a compass. The example I think you used was the caste system um, in the context of, of India, for example. Yeah. Um, could you expand really briefly on, the, on that idea of a compass and, um, you know, yeah. this, this balancing act between <clears throat> respecting, valuing um, uh, and learning from Indigenous wisdom, but also understanding the, the present and future context? That's a, that, I mean, that's such a huge question. Yes. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> um, let me think. So what I've, I mean, we have to understand ourselves <clears throat> as historical beings. We're cultural beings, which means we're historical beings. We are in our microcosmic self, in our own consciousness. We are the sum of our biographies, you know, family, place, birth, gender, race, all of that. Um, and so that's one. And then we've got a broader culture around us that we're part of. It's very much in, in the Australian, white Australian sense that we, we live. It's very much a... Um, a defined culture built around often concepts like exceptionalism, control, and yeah. manicurism. 
We we know it works. At some level, it works. We wouldn't be living in the world we have. We wouldn't be talking on Zoom now if this stuff doesn't work. So there's the magic of stuff that works. But often what works at one point ceases to work at another point. And other con the context in which our large systems sit are still larger systems. So we've got biospheric systems that are you know, leading towards climate change because of carbon, blah, blah, blah. So the question then is, what is our relationship to our cultures, plural, cultures, plural? You know, and that means that if we have a culture that is almost uh, monological, it just talks to itself, and it discounts other cultures. It's a culture that is uh, missing out on the collective wisdoms of other cultures. All cultures have much to offer in understanding mm. the human condition. But also because cultures are historical, there's a lot of rubbish in culture that we mistake as culture. I like Saka he, he, because he he said, look, there's a lot of stuff that we would really doesn't isn't culture. It's pseudo culture. It's culture. Yes. That, things that we do that masquerade, masquerades as culture. Yes. So let's take gender, you know, uh, and we, we were in a um, men are men and women are women, you know, um, and we, we if we have that binary uh, as our as our compass, to use that term, mm. then we uh, we miss out on the colour, the, the 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 fractal nature of human sexuality, relationality, and so on. Yeah, and and it means that we are cutting the world up. We're breaking the world apart. So that damages our potential to feel towards and work towards alternative futures that are more inclusive, more wholesome, more life affirming. Mm, so that siloed worldview that's embedded, and we can't yeah. even think about like that. So you know, when I use the term creative traditionalism, I know I'm walking on, uh, I'm playing with the double-edged sword. You know, the Nazis, they were fantastic creative traditionalists. They they saw the swastika and thought, we can take that from those Indian Aryan guys and we can turn it into something. That's absolute marketing genius. But it's, it, it damages the swastika, which is a beautiful symbol. It's like yeah. Christian cross or you know the om symbol you know it's those they, these are parts of the human um cultural cash that we have that you know affirms all the wonderful things that make us human but they damaged it so, so yeah. credit can be negative but for me it's more like if i can be aware of my own culture my own traditions and i can see those elements that are life affirming that are relational this is where the compass comes in the compass from a near humanist perspective is those things that help me step beyond my current limiting barriers of, of psychology and experience and so on and embrace something new and take it in and love it and be curious about it. Most people in our world are fearful of that which lies beyond their own context. Fear is a toxin. You know, and it makes us pessimistic. It makes us cynical. We can be clever because I've got a clever mind, so I can use language to dismantle optimism because we can say optimism is pie in the sky. But sure, there's head in the sand, optim uh, hope or optimism. I, I get that. You know, technology is going to save us, Kim. You know, we, we can rely on all those technologists out there to do the right thing and they're, they're, they'll come up with a, a, a fix for, the you know, climate change or whatever. But that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Optimism builds from each one of us as a, as a practice. We have to practice optimism and we have to feed it by feeding our, um, our sense of agency that I can do mm -hmm. something. If, even if it's just growing some veggies in the garden or, you know, helping the people next door who maybe have some some problem going on. And, and this, of course, is people have always helped people next door. Sometimes they've also killed them. But, you know, that you know, on the on the brighter side, you know, communities pride themselves on community um, commitment, to, commitment to community. Mm. So what am I saying? I'm saying I'm, I'm kind of doing this double thing here where, you know, creative traditionalism can be toxic, 
but it can also be something that really starts to liberate us. It, it honours the fact that me as a Western guy, you know, I was 13 when I started doing yoga. I had no idea why I started doing it. It just seemed like it was cool and interesting and different. It was different, especially in the, you know, at the, this was like 1970, 71. Mm. Or and it's why I'm committed to the body now. It's because so I can see back then, but what was yoga? Yoga was something from over there, from this other country, this other culture, this other society that was seeping into Western conservative. You know, it was in Western Australia. Australia was asleep in the 1970s. We had no idea about much of the stuff. So it was it was very interesting to see that. But what I understand now is that when yoga came into the West through Iyengar through the Beatles and all these these ways of bringing it in, that it was a form of creative tradition. And, and of course, I can see that you could say it was colonialist. We were ex appropriating a spiritual and physical practices from the East, and we were marketing eyes, marketizing it. You know, we could, you know, there, and so on. And that that happened too. But mm, and divorcing at times the physical from the spiritual. Absolutely, um, the Hatha yoga, but what what we tend to do and you did a really good job of doing that binary this that this that this that okay culture doesn't work like that mm. you know we can see that you can marketize meditation tm you know it's a massive yeah. movement you can and you know and, and people will benefit from it but there's something else happening there and it's often in the corners of cultural creation that we don't specifically identify, that we can see this, the best elements of creativity at work. Mm. You know, yeah. I've been I, I, I'm always reading stuff, as you know, you know, and, and reading this book, Rick Rubin's book, The Creative Act, you know, it's kind of like some kind of, uh, it, it's, it's a little, it's a sort of a manifesto filled with creative nuggets, but you I can feel all the way through that, that it is a mix of traditions. It's not just Western mystical traditions. And I should never say just because the Western mystical traditions are wonderful. Mm. But it is it is an amalgam of, he's roughly my age, it's an amalgam of his experiences of different cultures, different creative processes, different times, all coming together. And he's cherry picking from them. Yes. And making them available to people who are hungry to hear this kind of stuff. We're so hungry as a society, but we're, as I said, we're so scared. So a lot mm. of people don't have the inner uh, resources, that's the word, the inner resources to challenge their own commitment to a world that is actually going to kill us all if yeah. we don't do something. It's a nice segue into... Um my other question that I that I wanted to ask um, and that's a little bit around um, your own practices you know how do you incorporate neo-humanism or a love-centered approach um, into your life um, and I don't want to say even just in small ways but even in in daily you know ways that, yeah. that you operate and think and I also think um, uh you know, what you said at the end there is really interesting around some of us who maybe feel we don't have those inner resources to do so yep. yet. How can we start to cultivate that? Just before I let you answer, I think, um, as you know, we've been working with others recently on on rituals and the power of rituals yep. and, and the fact that things that seem... You know, these these conversations are massive. Obviously, we're talking yes, about the are. universe and the planet, but also, you know, what I think I've learned over the last few years in my studies is that um, that's all really important. But ultimately, this idea of internal regeneration and, and, and internal love um, and, and working on ourselves is 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 part of that. So that's a long winded way of asking. You know, do you can you share? Are you happy to share some of the practices yeah, that you? Sure incorporate into your life and also maybe reflect on um, some of the thinking that, you know, we've been doing um, and you've been doing for some time, I know, around ritual. Yeah. Ooh, what a great question. Um, let's start off with me. I mean, so I've already owned up the fact that I'm, I, I, I'm a, a lifelong committed yogi. 
um, I think the asana, the physical practice of yoga is so important as a basis for this body. Uh, and having those physical practices have allowed me at different times to explore other physical practices, let's say like my uh, commitment to, um, let's say, the improvisational treasure trove that is called interplay. I, I follow a symbol, uh, uh, or I'm part of a kind of pedagogy of the body and body wisdom that is uh, curated uh, by a group in America called uh, Interplay. And uh, that really extended aspects of my own creative potential. So the body at work, the body working in the garden, the body going to the gym, I do some of that stuff too. I, so there's the body. Around the body, then there is the culture of the body. And that to me is really, because um, what I'm doing is I'm building my argument of self from the body up. Yes. Start with physical. I'm a vegetarian. I have been uh, since what 1984 or something. <laughs> Just About happened around the same time as me. <laughs> no, I think yeah. that was like 1987 or something. <laughs> yeah. So there. So that. The, 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 so that it's what I eat. I am what I eat, sort of thing. And there's there's a whole psychology around that. Um. And I go into all of this stuff um, and, and sort of philosophical, social, uh, socio-ecological sustainability type areas as well. But I won't. I'm just telling you what I do. So there's the body there. The body eats. Um, I also have a deep love of aesthetics. Paintings on the wall behind me. Grew up in a visual arts family. Um, I'm a musician, so I play classical guitar, for instance, and I was in love with that since 1970, 71 as well. Same, roughly the same age I started doing yoga. Um, and that's been a lifelong passion for me. Poetry and the poetic. Oh, you know, one of the things that we often don't do is that language is because of the computer, but because of the way we teach as well has become very transactional, very functional. You know, you 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 go and read a cookbook to learn how to cook a, a, a pavlova or something. You So we, we use language that way. But to me, and I see this with my own students, is when I ask them about poetry, they glaze over. They become very uncomfortable because poetic requires or instills or calls us to be um, metaphorical thinkers think outside of the physicalities of language and instruction and managing information. So I write poetry, I publish my own poetry, uh, I see poetry as a vehicle to liberate consciousness. Okay, so there's that. Um, I also have a deep love of the, the stuff beyond the textual. I have a deep love of material culture and I see how material culture tells us stories about human love of form, human love of texture, uh, human ingenuity. It's just extraordinary, the kind of creative energies that come from it. I'll grab, here's a, I've got a fantastic Buddha here, for instance. I can stroke it. It's, it's made out of this beautiful wood. It's a rosewood Buddha, this one. I've got a number of them all along here because I collect things. Right? It's kind of like touching them. But, you know, so there's that, there's the, my engagement with all of this stuff. It's still kind of physical, even poetry, when I listen to the sounds of, 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 a, of a good voice speaking or reciting, reading poetry. But then what else is there? Well, there's also that underneath everything for me, is this concept of yearning. I write about it in that in the paper that you've just been talking about. To me, yearning is the evolutionary driver. And that probably sounds a little bit airy-fairy, and it probably is in some respects, but when I look at world history, when I look at the kind of intellectual material stuff that I'm working on all the time with students and so on, it comes back to why did people choose to expand? It's always this kind of expanded. It's always the next horizon. What's on the horizon? 
Why did you or I do a PhD? What, what madness is that? You know, it's, but we, it's because it's there and it is a possibility. And some part of us is called to explore that next horizon. And of course, once we get to that horizon, things open up. I, I, I end up being a, you know, a, a teacher at a university. Uh, you've got this fantastic job leading the, um, the state government's uh, sustainability line for the uh, Olympic Games, right, 2032. And it's because you have done all that groundwork that you were able to explore such an interesting and I think quite important kind of job. So we, we're always, I think, being called. Uh, what happens, though, is, of course, is that we often have our yearning, you could say, I call it a future sense, our yearning sensitivity damaged through social pressures, a judgment, you know, you're weird, you're different, or you're stupid, or you, because of, you can be yearning in, a, in an education system, and I, I, both of us have trained teachers, uh, and we can see that education doesn't value yearning, it values information management and control. Mm, funneling yearning, what is appropriate sort of yeah, yearning, yearning yeah, for the achievement of a particular result as opposed to necessarily the, the knowledge or connection with um with others or for example so yeah, yeah. i think that's uh, that's so true it's it's again that yearning from a head not the heart center yes yes absolutely i and you know one of the things i ask my first year students uh when when i first meet them in the very first session i say what are you curious about and a lot of them find it really hard to answer mm -hmm. they're not really curious and I and I remember reading. I, I actually showed them a quote from Carl Sagan, this wonderful uh, scientist from the 20th century, um, cosmos and all that stuff. And he said, "Look, I can go. This is Sagan talking now. I can go into a, a class of year one or two students, and they want to know everything about the planets and the sun and the you know why are there rainbows." And he says, "I go and see a group of students in year 12 at the end of their high school period, and." That none of that, none of that excitement, none of that curiosity is there. And so maybe says, we oh, have, um, but we can learn from five and six, four, five and six year olds about neo humanism, even if they don't know the term. No, they, you don't need to know the term. It, it, it's, you know, like with philosophy, we often come up with words that help us express something yes. because we don't have the words. But we don't need words to be wise or in, in in tune with that sort of stuff so to me this yearning is really important because it means mm. i have to have fun i have to find forms of self-expression i make sourdough uh, and cheeses and you know i'm in the garden i'm running around you know, i am hyperactive it's so that i can <laughs> but you know there's that sort of stuff and behind each one of those there's a story yes. a story of how human beings started to discover fermentation i just i get so I'm, I'm a real nerd i get really excited by that sort of stuff but then what else is happening well to me i think of fermentation as a metaphor for culture culture mm. is always ferment fermenting we are fermenting you, know, you and i are sharing ideas now we've never had a discussion quite like this no it's really exciting it's it, it's it's liberating but then something else is happening to that Yearning. For me, something from my earliest days, a kind of spiritual calling. There was something saying to me, hey, we've got all this material stuff. There's something else there, something that you can't put your finger on. It's culture at some levels, it's story, but there's also a yearning to connect to broader things. And that for me led me ultimately to uh, a form of meditation. It's an Indian system taught by Prabhat Ranjan Saka. And I've been doing that now for 37 years or something ridiculous like that, you know. And I do it every day, as you, as you mentioned at the beginning when you introduced me, and I do it twice a day. And it's it's not like I sit down for hours or I retreat to the mountaintops <laughs> and caves and stuff, but I do that sort of stuff. And I'm committed to it. I'm, I, it's the thing that I have done naturally without having to force myself. And this makes me a little weird because usually sometimes you have to say, oh, 
got to go and I've got to do this. I got to, I'm not doing it enough, whatever. No, it's not that sort of story. No, if it's just a way of affirming that yearning and nurturing that yearning. And that means that there's this other form of spirit out there. It's, it, I love the Indian language, Indian language for spirituality. That's the Hindu Vedic tantric language of bhakti. Bhakti is the devotional. And, you know, St. Francis of Assisi was a bhakti. Uh, and so we've got a lot of bhakti, uh, that kind of devotional stuff within Christianity. But you can also be a bhakti and a total atheist. Yeah. I don't see that it is, it, it's a, it's certainly not aligned to religious Absolutely. structures. It is a love affair Bhakti is basically a love affair with the world. And one that doesn't need, I think that it comes back to something you've said to me previously and, and I think even we've said today is that it's not about having the answers or um, understanding an idea of an absolute truth. It's almost actually about this ongoing questioning and learning and yearning about not only ourselves and the world around us but the universe as well. And, you know, from what you've said there, Marcus, you're doing that not just, not only through your meditative practice and, and through yoga, but also through um, your approach to the activities you're doing in your life as well. Um, and I think that that's, um, that's really beautiful. But also, again, coming back to those ideas about um, optimism and not being paralysed by the uh, scale of some of the challenges that we face, you know, societally and, and yep. planetarily. Um, is that, you know, it's almost like an attitude and this um, uh, love-centred approach that you can incorporate into life um, as well. And yeah. I think that um, that does challenge some of maybe the cultural or, or, you know, religious approaches where there's this idea of only one truth. And and um, and I think um, potentially, you know, this, this op uh, opening ourselves up to, uh, to this ongoing process of learning is 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 the yep. key. Yep, absolutely. And, and if we can't love, we are in trouble. It's it's that simple to me. And we and we and this need to understand everything is an illness. You know, we can't understand a lot of this stuff, but we can experience moments of it. That, that moment when you. you walk outside and you see a rainbow and suddenly you go. And I was just, just about that, to say that, that nature, that's how you get that connection to nature, not necessarily yeah. by reading about it. And it's, no. it's you have to feel that. And I think, um, you know, you then when you're in these amazing kind of natural experiences, it actually gives you an understanding of the fact that, and not in a bad way, but of your insignificance you know um in, yep. in in a in, in a good way um in that you know mm -hmm. that there's the, the the power of the, the natural world as well so um i agree i think that's one of those things that has to be has to be felt which yep. to me to me i think it's um when we you know coming back to the the article that you've written and and this idea of neo-humanism i think it's um it's been really interesting to talk to you about how um not only you know your understanding of what neo -human, humanism is and it being a love centered um essentially a love centered a way of thinking and approaching the world and the universe but um also those ideas of of connection um not only to other humans but to, to everything um and then the ways that that can be you know in some ways quite simply incorporated yeah. into our lives i think is is really is really special so um is there anything else that you wanted to add today about neo-humanism, yeah. Marcus, before we... Just that it makes sense. In, mm -hmm. in other words, when you take love as a principle of action and being, it means that you it, it actually has its own form of reason. Now, I, in my educational journey, I've, I've been immersed for couple of decades in critical theory i see near humanism as a very clear expression of critical theory that's extended because it brings in spirituality that love quotient critical theory is a is a is a form of love there's no doubt about it 
But, you know, some of the most interesting critical theorists uh, over the last, you know, many decades have been people who have stepped into that uncomfortable space of spirituality. Yeah. Bell Hooks is a brilliant example of that. She died just recently, but she was a wonderful thinker, mm. but great teacher, um, and highly uh, articulate in terms of able to reach through ordinary language not nothing too esoteric about her writing at all but she writes from that love sense and she definitely explored her own roots of spirituality in the she's an african-american uh, baptist from the south then she approached and got involved uh, and really internalized buddhism mm. she did some really interesting work with Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a wonderful buddhist yeah thing. You know, so and who you mentioned in the article as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, he's he's an exception. He just died recently, too. It's really it's sad that all these people are dying, but there are to me, I think so. There's one, there's two things I want to say. One is that there is a it has a deep critical theoretical implications, neo humanism does, and it's given me the ability to articulate that. And two, the um, the fact that it's a it actually carries a force and that we need new forms of language to explore new forms of living and being so that is why i will i gravitate to the term near humanism because it means something to me both at the personal level of my own intellectual journey as you know but also because it, it is a vehicle that empowers me to explain and describe and explore those things that are happening to us now because we don't know what's happening we cannot judge in that way all we can say is that our cultures every culture at some level causes harm how do we reduce harm and how do we affirm relationship that's it for me <laughs> ultimately well, that's a i like both of those points as a a really lovely summary of what we've spoken about today and also what's in your article as well. Um, thank you for spending the time to talk through that with us um, in more detail and with me in more detail, Marcus. I think you're right. It's something when I read your work on neo-humanism that it makes sense not only in my head but in my heart as well. And it's um, I think the way, what you just articulated then about the importance of language that can kind of provide a vehicle for us to discuss some of these ideas and concepts which are really big but so fundamental to, to who we are um, is really important so thank you so much thank you it's been a real pleasure King thank you for giving me your, your time because ultimately um, we cross fertilize so it's nice <laughs> and um, yeah hope we get to talk again Absolutely. Thanks so much, Marcus. Thanks, Em. Bye-bye.